Good afternoon, and thank you for taking your seats. I feel like an elementary school teacher. Boys and girls, please be seated. Fold your hands in your laps. We're all ready to get started here today. We have an inspiring hour ahead of us. I'm Jim Dever from King 5's Evening Magazine. I only say that because I'm looking for some positive feedback right now. That woman right there, thank you, I appreciate that. I'll be your MC this afternoon as we learn more about Child Haven's impact on children and families today, tomorrow, always. Most of you know that Child Haven has been an important part of our community for more than 100 years. Early on, Seattle Day Nursery is what it was called. It was a safe and affordable place for working mothers to bring their children. For the last 30 years, it has been a safe haven for babies, toddlers, and preschoolers who have suffered from abuse and neglect. Through the decades, tens of thousands of children have felt Child Haven's loving touch, healed today for their trauma, prepared to learn and succeed tomorrow in kindergarten, and influenced over a lifetime by the foundation of care that they received at Child Haven. And by working with both children and families, Child Haven is breaking that cycle of abuse and neglect and contributing to the health and well-being of our whole community. It's good to know that Child Haven is here for kids, for families, and for all of us always. This afternoon, you'll see the impact of Child Haven firsthand through two people who will share their personal stories with you. And you'll also be able to make an impact yourself by donating a little bit later on in our program to support Child Haven's important work. But don't write those checks just yet. You're going to have the opportunity to double, to double the impact of your donation today thanks to an incredibly generous matching gift. So stay tuned. We'll tell you more about that very, very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Child Haven President Maria Chavez Wilcox. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. You know, as I was leaving my office this morning, somebody gave me a wonderful tapestry that is outside of my office door that has sayings on them like hope, passion, strength, inspiration, guidance. And the one that I chose as I was leaving the office, and Melissa, thank you so much for giving me this incredible gift, was strength. Because really and truly, it is what we are all facing each and every day at Child Haven and in our lives. The strength to face our fears and our challenges and move forward. I thank you for the incredible outpouring of support today and for helping us in share the stories of the strides that Child Haven is making to permanently end child abuse and neglect in this community. Child Haven, as it has, for the past 104 years, continues to relentlessly treat and care for our most young, vulnerable victims of abuse, our children, allowing them to face their fears head on, have the strength to move forward, and be able to heal their scars so that they can move on to brighter futures. You know, as I was pondering speaking to you today, there are many stories that I could have chosen to share with you about Child Haven. I could have chosen to tell you about our desperate parents, our tenacious caseworkers, or our dedicated staff. And let me just pause and tell you that I have never worked with such incredible staff in my 30 plus year career as a nonprofit leader, and I am so proud of them, and you should be too. They're incredible. I could have also chosen to talk to you about some of our incredibly generous contributors, like all of you in this room. But really and truly, the stories about Child Haven are about our children, like Mateo and Alicia. Mateo and Alicia came to Child Haven through Child Protective Services because their neighbor had heard screaming in the house next door. Mateo and Alicia were found tied up in a dark closet. When they walked through the doors of Child Haven, they walked through with incredible pain 
and fear and scars that had already been embedded in their little bodies at a very young age. Child Haven's role is to help our children overcome those scars and become children again. Mateo and Alicia were very different children when they came to Child Haven. Alicia was much younger and just needed a lot of affection and love and attention. Mateo, on the other hand, was angry. He would be known to throw things continually at our staff and caseworkers. Through very caring therapeutic intervention, incredible dedication and diligence, our staff worked with Mateo day after day. Interestingly, the hardest time for Mateo was nap time. He didn't trust that if he closed his eyes, he could wake up to anything but the horrors of another darkened closet without food and his hands tied up with string. Over time, Mateo learned to trust. And yes, eventually healed those scars. And guess what? Close his eyes and take nap time knowing he could wake up to love and caring and an environment where he would be safe and have nothing to fear. I am very happy to report to you that today, Mateo and Alicia were adopted by their foster mom, and we've heard from her very recently that they're both taking dance classes. So they have healed that scar of abuse and are moving on, dancing their way to a brighter future. You know, if you were to come during, to Child Haven during any given day, or at any of our branches, what you would see would be our teachers continually interacting with our children, talking with them, listening to them, playing with them, giggling with them, and yes, sometimes even crying with them. And if you were to come during lunchtime, which is my favorite time in George Hubman's, what you would see is the teacher sitting with the children, perhaps counting out the different peas or carrots on their plate, or naming colors, but always being engaged, always being there for them relentlessly. You know, there's a very famous child psychologist, Haim Janot, who said, in pondering about the impact that each and every one of us, each and every one of us, has on the lives of children. Children are like cement. What falls on them makes an imprint. Child Haven's mission is to permanently change that imprint by looking and finding, and we do, the soft spots in their personality where we can intervene with therapeutic care love, and yes, a lot of hugs at times, to change that imprint so that they can learn to trust and have the confidence to move forward with their lives. Once again, the strength. That's the goal of Child Haven, and that's what we do each and every day toward ending the cycle of abuse, not only for today and for tomorrow, but forever. Each one of you in this room is a hero. Or maybe you're a shero because you are here because you want to make a difference. But not only because you want to make a difference, but because you want to make a difference that really matters in the lives of our children, our families, and our community. And for that, we acknowledge you and thank you. Thank you. You truly are making an incredible difference in the lives of children. And there is no greater calling that I can think of in life than changing a child's perspective about the world to be able to be permanently healed and face the world being able to dance to sing, to dream, to take nap time, to laugh, to giggle, and to trust. Really and truly, it is the highest calling that I can think of in life. 
You know, today I am incredibly proud and honored because it is my role to be able to bestow upon an organization Child Haven's highest recognition award, the Mark Matthews Service to Children Award. This award is named after our founder, Mark Matthews, who founded Seattle Day Nursery that later became Child Haven. I am very proud and honored to be able to let you know that the organization that we are really bestowing with our highest honor today is the Boeing Company. The Boeing Company has stood by Child Haven for decades, really believing in the mission to not only help our children, but end abuse in this community. In addition to that, I think that we would all agree that the Boeing Company is a beacon in this community for the greatest possible philanthropic support on behalf of children and families and individuals on an ongoing basis and their commitment to that is relentless. If you were to come to Child Haven, you would at any time during our days see Boeing executives in shirts and ties in our boardroom, or perhaps in jeans and t-shirts, painting classrooms, or interacting with our children. They have given of their time and their heart. In addition to that, the Child Haven Company has in the last dozen years given over half a million dollars, that's a lot of zeros, to help our work. I am honored to be able to present Child Haven's highest award, the Mark Matthew Service to Children Award to Louis Mancini and ask him to come on stage. And Louis, let me see if I can get the title right. Lewis is the Senior Vice President, Commercial Aviation Services, Boeing Commercial Airplanes. How do you put all that on a name tag? I'm gonna tell you. Um, and we're thrilled to have him. Lewis, thank you very much. Here you go. Well, you're looking at one lucky man, I'll tell you. Um, and I'm lucky for a lot of reasons. The biggest luck factor here is I happen to work for Boeing. And I've been there 11 years now. And we're really looking forward in 2016 to hit 100 years. And to think of your organization being 104 years long and prosperous, my congratulations to you. Please, another round of applause, Maria. One of the reasons, the other lucky reason I'm here is because 20 years ago I met Susanna Darcy Henneman. Susanna, why don't you uh, please stand? You're part of the board of the institution. Okay. <laughs> Susanna was a test pilot, and she was uh, part of the certification of our fabulous 777. I was a VP of engineering for a customer called United Airlines, launch customer, and, and we had Susanna come down to talk to us about the airplane, and then in May of 95, we came up to pick up the first of what has been a fabulous program for Boeing. And so I now have an opportunity to have been a customer, and now I get to work with great people like Susanna every day. So it, it's a kick. Also in the audience I saw here is Scott Carson. I worked for Scott. Scott was a great leader of the company, and I, I'm glad to see him here today. And thank you, Scott, for participating. Okay, one last comment for you. My luck is going to run out. You know, uh, like any big business, we have our challenges at Boeing. We have a lot of successes and a few challenges. And when I look back at our challenges, and then I see that video that you showed, Maria, and I see what you do for young people, it almost makes what we do at Boeing kind of small. And to give a young person the opportunity to grow up and live your dream. There's no better calling. My congratulations to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Lou, and thank you to the Boeing Company for all you've done to support Child Haven and our whole community, as a matter of fact. And thank you, too, to uh, Maria. We're glad we can all be a part of the impact that Child Haven is making on children today and throughout their lives. Since 1909, it's been people like all of us in this room who have enabled Child Haven to heal children and strengthen families. Today, the Second Century Campaign is paving the way for Child Haven to have an even greater impact on abused and neglected kids for the next century. Your donation today will support the campaign and its goal of raising $20 million over five years. You can learn more about the Second Century Campaign in the brochure that's on your table. Now let's take a moment to recognize a few dedicated people and groups who also make remarkable contributions to Child Haven. Child Haven's advisory board is made up of individuals who have a wealth of experience and remarkable expertise in child development, health, and welfare. The Board of Trustees guides the agency through advocacy, fundraising, and financial oversight so that Child Haven remains the strong and viable organization it's been for over a century. And today's table captains make sure that you all have arrived here with full hearts and full wallets, we're hoping, to make this event a success. So let's give all these dedicated people a round of applause right now. Give you another two minutes to read that. Oh, okay, it's gone. Thanks to all these individuals, thanks to Child Haven's dedicated staff, and thanks to all of you, especially here this afternoon. Child Haven is making an impact today, right this very minute, on hundreds of children and their families. At Child Haven, as well as throughout our community and nation, many families consist of grandparents raising their grandchildren. In fact, nationwide, nearly one in every 12 families is headed by grandparents who are full-time moms or dads to their grandchildren. Here to tell you more about the profound difference that Child Haven has made in one of those families is Lori Henry. Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. Have you ever been so angry that you scream nonstop for an hour? Have ever gotten so mad that you let loose with a string of profanity at the top of your lungs? Or race around the house, hitting furniture and walls? Or struck out at a sibling or a parent? Has your frustration ever hit such a peak that you flew into a rage or violent and uncontrollable? that the people who loved you had to take you to an emergency room to calm you down. Of course you haven't. But my three-year-old grandson did all those things and a lot more. Isabel came to live with me and my husband, Tim, When he was 18 months old, his mother, my daughter Brooke, started abusing drugs when she was in middle school. By the time Isma was born, she was addicted to Oxycontin and had been in and out of rehab many times, always falling back into her old habits. Brooke also was living with a violent and dangerous man. Isma saw his mother He had beaten up by his father countless times. And his dad beat Ismail too, even when he was a baby. There was drug dealing in the house, terrible emotional abuse, and so many awful things I can't bear to share with you. When we finally got Ismail away from the situation, we thought he'd be okay. All he needed was loving grandparents and a stable home, right? We were so, so wrong. Ismail came to us, an emotionally damaged little boy, needed intensive help that we simply not equipped to to give him. 
Tim and I never expected to be parents again. We raised our kids years before in the only way we knew how. But when you're trying to be a parent to a child who's abused, traditional discipline is not the way to go. What would you do if your toddler, who drew incredible physical strength from his rages, ran wildly across the tops of furniture while screaming obscenities, refusing every attempt to calm him down. We took him to Children's Hospital at those times because we just didn't know what else to do. We loved Ismo, but we were also caring for his baby sister, Jasmine, and we were afraid he'd hurt her. All of our lives were spinning out of control Tim and I even got to the point where we talked about putting Ismail into an institution. It broke our hearts, but we didn't feel we had any choice. That's how bad things were with his uncontrollable temper and violent acting out. Then came Child Haven. I didn't know what to think when they told me Ismail was going into therapeutic childcare. I also resisted the idea that I would have to work with Child Haven too. I didn't understand that the therapy for both the parents and the kids is essential to healing these children who've been abused and neglected. At Child Haven, Ismael's teachers helped him learn how to manage his anger in his classroom. And I worked with counselors to help me change my parenting style to support what Ismael was learning in the classroom at home. Slowly, Child Haven teachers help Ismael learn to express his feelings in words instead of by acting out. I learned to speak calmly to him, to offer him choices with consequences, and to be consistent with my discipline. Child Haven also showed me how important it was for me to just hold him read or color with him and play games with him. I had to let Ismail know that I would be there for him no matter what, in good times and bad. You see, trust is a huge is issue with kids like Ismail. His early home life was so disruptive. He never knew if he'd if he'd get kissed or slapped. There was chaos all around him. He didn't trust anyone, and who could blame him? Child Haven rebuilt Ismo's trust. He soon began forming good relationships with other kids. In class, he wasn't an angry bully. He was a kind and thoughtful leader. At Child Haven, Ismo learned social skills along with his ABCs. And by the time he graduated in 2011, he was ready to enter kindergarten academically, socially, and emotionally. Today, Ismail is an outgoing, smart, positive little boy. He's loving, protective towards his sister, and friendly with all the kids in his first grade class. He isn't perfect, what seven-year-old is. But he can get angry now without the, without the awful rage and violence. And we all live in a calmer and much happier household. I thank God for Child Haven every day. It is the best thing that ever happened to Ismail. He got a very rocky start in life, but thanks to Child Haven, Ismail now has a life that is full of joy and future ahead of him that is full of promise. It's people like you who make life for kids like Ismail possible. Thank you. Thank you for giving me my beautiful, happy grandson.
so don't need this guy. Thank you, Lori. You and Ismail have come a long way, and we're also very proud of you and grateful that you shared that story with us. My name is Borek Peshtaz, and I'm a member of the board of directors here at Child Haven. I'm also the father of a five-year-old son named Kaihan and of Afghan immigrants. My family knows what it means to struggle just to survive. My mother, my father, my little sister, and I narrowly escaped the violence and chaos that erupted when the communist regime took over the Afghan government in 1979. At the time, I was only three years old. The flight or flight adrenaline rush that comes from fearful situations is something that the children of Child Haven experience all the time. Imagine trying to make friends. Imagine trying to learn your ABCs. Or even just sleeping peacefully when your brain is in a near constant state of panic and confusion. That's what abuse and neglect does to little kids. But I've seen how Child Haven can calm those fears. Child Haven brings safety where there was risk, consistency where there was chaos, security where there was doubt. Child Haven brings healing, hopes, and hugs. Today, you all can give these gifts to the children of Child Haven. For more than a century now, Child Haven has cared for the most vulnerable kids in our community. We are now in the second year of our second century campaign, a deliberate, strategic, and scaled up effort to ensure that Child Haven can grow and stabilize its funding sources so that we can remain a vital resource for children, families, and the community for the next 100 years. Every donation that you and others make between now and the end of the year in 2017 will count toward our campaign goal of $20 million. Now, table captains, please take a moment and hand out your pledge forms. As you all consider making your gift, please know that we will appreciate whatever amount you choose to donate. But also know that today you have a very unique opportunity to make an even bigger difference thanks to a $300,000 match by an anonymous donor. Now this is a real match, and it's a remarkable chance for all of us to make an enormous difference. Child Haven will not receive the $300,000 unless we all step up and donate at least $250 each. On your pledge card, you'll also find details on how you can double, triple, and even quadruple the impact of your donation. Also on your card, you'll find a way to increase the impact on the children of Child Haven by making a second donation at the end of the year, thanks to another match by Sterling Realty Organization. Now, I know you all agree, no child should live in fear. They should sing and laugh and heal. Abuse and neglect do not have to ruin the lives of children. Thanks to Child Haven, that damage can be reversed forever. Kids and families can recover, and the cycle of abuse and neglect can be broken. You all can make that happen today. So I ask you, please, give generously. Thank you. Thank you, Bork, and uh, thank you, Lori, too. What a remarkable transformation you've made in Ismail's life, with, uh, along with Child Haven, of course, making that happen. We would like to give a warm welcome to all the elected officials in the room today. We're especially pleased that First Lady of Washington State, Trudy Inslee, has been able to join us. So thank you all 
for being here, and thank you for your support for Child Haven. While you're all filling out your pledge forms, please remember that special match you just heard about. By making a gift of at least $250, you can make an even bigger impact on children today, tomorrow, and for a lifetime. Before we move on to another remarkable story of Child Haven's impact, we would like to recognize the sponsors who are making it possible for every dollar that you donate today to go directly to support Child Haven's care for neglected and abused children and its efforts to break the cycle of abuse and neglect forever. First, our gold level sponsor is Primera Blue Cross. Our silver sponsors are Blue Cora, Charlie's Produce, Coinstar, Nintendo, and Riddell Williams. Okay, uh, we have a bit of a list here ahead of us, so please hold your applause until I introduce all of our bronze level sponsors. Boeing, First Choice Health, Fortune Bank, Money Tree, and Seattle Children's. Okay, now you can clap. And our media sponsors are King Five. You can break in right now and clap for them if you want. Might as well break the rule on that one. And Seattle Met. Child Haven asks that you consider the businesses like these that support the causes you care about when you make your own business decisions or when you're sitting down to watch television, seven o'clock weeknights. <laughs> One more time, let's thank all of our sponsors. <laughs> just trying to get the blood flowing to your hands for writing those checks. Now just sit back and get ready to meet a really remarkable young man, Norris Frederick. A living tribute to the power of love, determination, and child haven. So I was told growing up that you can become a product of your environment. And if that's true today, then I don't know what I'm doing here in front of you guys. I grew up in Seattle <clears throat> to a single parent being raised by four, or a single mother raising four children in a house where beatings were more common than breakfast and a father being drunk was more common than a father being present. And where the temptation for me to act out, run away, go astray was much stronger than the temptation of me succeeding and the expectations of me doing well in school. If you add these kind of things into the life and the kind of experiences that I had involving racial discrimination, gang violence, disappointment, loss, and even death in my family, it was the recipe for failure for me. The product of that environment today would be in jail. He even might be dead, or at the very least, he'd be one messed up kid. One messed up kid. He wouldn't have been a star high school athlete. He would have never been a student leader. He would have never attended the University of Washington on a full athletic scholarship. He would have never had earned a degree in computer science and another one in marketing. He would have never been one of the most decorated athletes in Washington state history. He also would have never been an 11-time NCAA All-American or trained for the Olympic Games in 2008 and 2012. Or earned a job as an assistant coach at the University of California, Los Angeles. <laughs> and there's, there's never going to be, or there is no way that this guy at the age of 27, have lived, have lived his entire life a non-drinker, a non-drug user, someone who works really hard, who loves his family, and still manages to dream big. The product of that environment, I don't think that that's me. I prefer to look at myself as the product of my potential. I was just two years old. <laughs> I was just two years old when I came to Child Haven. 
with my older brother Gregory. Because I was so small, my memory is a bit fuzzy. But one thing that I do remember, it was it was one place where I could have two solid meals each day, breakfast and lunch. In a household where alcoholism ruled the day, meals were often hard to come by. I also remember being a handful of trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a substitute teacher in my time at Child Haven, and her name was Alicia Roper. She told me that she remembers me being scary and angry, and I would act out. But what she also told me was that I was funny, I was caring, and I was full of contradictions. Swearing up a blue streak one moment, crawling into her lap the next moment, asking her to read me a story. Alicia told me that I was really, really slow to trust, but once I trusted you, I'd be loyal to you forever. Being at Child Haven was definitely different than being at home. Even though I was rowdy and angry and still chose to act out, my teachers never responded with me in anger or a slap or the snap of a belt. They were calm and kind. And it was the first place I remember being outside of home or being outside of my family as well, where people cared so much about me and what I could be and what I was destined to be, and they never treated me in the moment. My, brother, my mother brought me and my brother to Child Haven back in the early 1980s, or late 1980s, early 1990s, because she struggled at home. And she struggled to do what was best for us. No matter, how bang, no matter how bad things got at home, I never doubted that my mom loved me. And she did what was best for her family with the means that she had. I've always had more respect and more admiration for my mom than I can ever put into words. My father was a kind and generous man, and he would have did everything he possibly could to help his family, even if it meant for him to go to jail in hopes that it would help support. But when it came to him drinking, he just became a different individual, a violent individual. It was awful that somebody that I loved so much could be so affected by something that I hated so much, and that was the alcohol. My dad would get into terrible fights with my mother, and he was never slow to raise his hand to me and my older brothers. Every time that there was an argument, I knew for a fact that somebody was going to get beat up. At the very least, I knew somebody was going to walk away hurt. For a long time, that's how I thought my, I thought that's what life was. I thought it was typical in every household. All the way until I got to sixth grade, I went to Eckstein Middle School, and I met a friend at the time. His name was Danny Sherrard, and he soon became my best friend afterwards. He would invite me over to his house on Saturdays to stay the night. I remember one Saturday morning. It wasn't like other Saturdays. I walked downstairs, walked into the kitchen, and his mother had made us breakfast, an English muffin with an egg and a sausage. That wasn't common in my house, so it was everything was just different. Didn't make any sense, but I thought it was cool. <laughs> I remember picking up my breakfast and walking into the living room, and I sat down and watched TV. Danny was still upstairs asleep. I remember hearing his parents starting to argue. It got louder and louder. And then I heard the footsteps of Danny walking down the street or down the stairs. He walked into the kitchen and got his food and came out and sat right next to me as if nothing was going on. I remember turning to Danny and saying, Danny, I think, you know, I think that we should leave. He looked at me and said, for what? I said, well, your mom and dad are arguing, and I don't want to see your dad beat your mom up. And he turned to me and said, that's not how it happens. I looked at him, and I was like, I'm pretty sure that's how it happens. <laughs> He told me that they were going to sit down, talk about it, and offer to take us to ice cream later. <laughs> I 
I once again told him that's not what's going to happen either. <laughs> what he was saying to me actually didn't even make any sense. I had seen this movie so many times, I knew the outcome. But that's exactly what happened. When we got to the ice cream place, his parents sat me down and asked me questions. They asked me questions about my family, questions I wasn't ready for. They asked me, when my parents get upset, do they hit each other? It was embarrassing. It hurt me. And I took offense to it. But then again, I did answer them yes, because that's all that I knew. The more they asked, the more upset and angry I got. And now, looking back at it now, the only thing I did was prove them right. That day, I realized that my life wasn't so typical after all. You might think that growing up in Seattle, Washington 20 years ago, that racism wasn't as such a big deal here as it is in other places. Well, you'd be wrong. There was a lot of racism in my elementary school. There were a lot of weapons, gangs, even at a young age. I got into fights, I got into trouble, but being disciplined or suspended or even threatened with expulsion it wasn't a threat to me. What could be worse than what I was going through at home as, as a young kid? In the fourth grade, I attended West Willen Elementary School, and there was a principal by the name of Mr. Wells who brought me into his office and threatened expulsion. I told him, I don't care what you do. Go on and expel me. What's the worst that you can possibly do? You've walked me home once this year and watched my dad beat the hell out of me on the patio. Do what you have to do. Mr. Wells was a black guy, so I had a different type of respect for him. I treated him differently. I respected him. I didn't want guidance, but guidance is what I needed. He looked at me and said, you're screwing up. And before you're 16 years old, if you're not behind bars, before you're 16 years old, if you're not behind bars, then you'll probably be dead. What he said to me finally sunk in. The answer wasn't violence anymore. All the fighting needed to stop. I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to be the screw up with no future that so many people in my life had told me that I'd end up. That day, Mr. Mar Mr. That day, Mr. Wells made a difference in my life. And so did a few other people. Remember Alicia? When she left Child Haven shortly after I did, she came and asked my mom if she could see me on the weekends. Her and I had a special type of connection, and she soon became my godmom afterwards. She would come to my house and put up charts, and every time I read a book, she'd give me a gold star. After a certain amount of gold stars, after a certain number of gold stars, she would take me to Fred Meyer and she let me pick out every candy toy that I wanted to. You guys can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> She'd pick me up on the weekends and take me to lunch. She'd take me to the zoo. But everything we did was always education focused. One thing that I've always admired about Alicia, she didn't look like me, she didn't dress like me, she didn't talk like me, and she sure didn't relate to me like my father did when he got upset. Instead, Alicia would sit me down and tell me things like, I'm disappointed in you. When those words came out of her mouth, I'd rather her have taken off a belt and hit me. I never heard those words before, so it hurt. My relationship with Alicia was the first time that I had ever trusted somebody that wasn't black. And she's been in my life ever since. In middle school, I started playing basketball. And by the time I got to Roosevelt High School, I was a freshman playing on the varsity basketball team. But I was still angry and chose to act out. 
My history teacher, Mr. Barnes, had a stuttering problem. And every time he would get mad, his face would turn red. And I would take that time to make fun of him. It didn't take long for him to put his foot down. In front of the entire class, he took it out on me. Mr. Barnes told me, you think you're a hero because you can dribble a ball? You're nothing but a clown. And if you don't realize that now, then you'll never make anything of yourself. The second week of high school changed my entire life. For the, last, for the next four years, I had more respect for Mr. Barnes than I had for anybody else in my entire life. He wasn't a teacher anymore to me. He wasn't those types of teachers that would push me through the system just to get them out of my way. Mr. Barnes challenged me, and he cared for me, and I knew he'd always be there for me if I needed anything. Like the time when I got upset with my mom and used a swear word, and my mom told me to leave, I had nobody else to call, so I called Mr. Barnes. And him and his wife opened up their home to me. Or when I started being recruited, Mr. Barnes chose to go on recruiting trips to make sure that they put <laughs> Okay, we got it. Mr. Barnes would go on recruiting trips with me to make sure that they put my education first and my athletic accolades second. I'm honored today to tell you guys that Alicia and Mr. Barnes are here today, along with my, mother, my lovely mother, Darlene. And I'm... And I want to tell them in front of everybody just how much I love them and care for them and how much they've helped me. If you three people would please stand up so we can give you an applause. By the time that I graduated high school, I'd gotten into track and field. It wasn't like basketball. I didn't have a team of five other people to help me out when I couldn't pick up the slack for myself. My success in track and field was solely dependent on me. If I wanted something great to happen, I had to put in the legwork. But if something went wrong, I had nobody else to blame but myself. I won five state championships in just three years while I was in high school. I broke every high school record that there was. I was named the, track and field, or the best track and field athlete in the entire country by my senior year. I qualified for my, world, my first world championship team as a teenager, as a senior in high school where I placed 11th and 7th in the world in my two events, the high jump and the long jump. I had my pick at any college in the, in the entire country with a full athletic scholarship. And when I signed with the University of Washington, I felt like I owned the world. But just one month into my freshman year, I remember my dorm room, my dorm room phone ringing. It was my mom calling me, and I never heard her cry like that before in my life. And she kept saying that there was an emergency and that I needed to come home. Without any question, I got in my roommate's car and I left. 
the entire drive, I was just telling myself, please let there be nothing going on with my mom or just my little brother, anything else I can handle. I remember pulling up to the driveway at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I saw that every light in the house was on. And I also saw my mom sitting in the backyard, holding herself, rocking, crying. I asked no questions. I just hugged her and told her everything was going to be OK. And she looked at me and said, Norris, your father's been stabbed to death by his girlfriend. I've told you that my father was a violent drunk and that he served time in, in jail, that he had beaten me and my mom and my brothers. But what I didn't tell you guys is how much I loved him. My father was a good man with an even better heart, but just a bad problem. And as far as my three older brother, or my three brothers, they weren't his kids by blood, but he took care of them. And when he wasn't drinking, he was funny and giving, and he would tell me things like, be better than me. There was never, there were so many times where I didn't like my father, but there was never a time where I didn't love him. After my dad was killed, I felt myself shutting down. I didn't care about track and field. I didn't care about academics. I didn't care about anything at that point. I remember the next few days, I tried to push through it. I went to practice that Monday, and I showed up just trying to go through the motions as if nothing happened. And we had a volunteer coach that looked at me, and the only thing she had to say were three words to make me give everything up. So I stormed out. I headed back to my dorm room. I was going to pack all of my things. I was done. I remember walking back and asking myself, maybe everybody was right. Maybe I wouldn't amount to anything. Or maybe I just didn't care at the end of the day. Then the head track and field coach, Greg Metcalf, showed up at my dorm room with the support of my mom behind, her, behind him. They sat me down on my bed and told me that they weren't going to let me quit, that they wouldn't give up on me, and they wouldn't let me give up on myself. I could clearly see in their eyes that they believed in me, and they weren't about to stop letting me believe myself. That was the first time since my father's death that I actually shed a tear. My coach grabbed my shoulder, and he said, Norris, if it takes you six years to graduate from this university, I'll pay it in my own pocket. He reminded me that he wasn't going to let me be a failure. He told me I wasn't going to be behind bars. And then he said he would never let me be a product of my environment. I looked at him and I said, Coach, don't make promises to me that you don't mean or ones that you can't keep. I've had enough broken promises in my life. He looked at my mom and said, Darlene, I'll take care of your son as if he were my own. He looked at me and said, you take all the time you need, but don't give up on me, because I'd never give up on you. I took a few months. I tried my best to deal with my father's death. And then when I went back to practice, the very first meet of my entire college career I had the number one jump in the world for five months recorded by any human being on the face of this planet. All the anger that I kept inside and let build up, I finally found a release for it. My life actually changed that day. I had a future. I had things to lose. And I had things to work for. And as far as Coach Metcalf, for the next four years, he held up his end of the bargain. He treated me just like one of his sons. 
During my college career, I had a career that many young men would only dream about. Records broken, honors, awards, so many different opportunities. Although I was always proud of what I achieved, I was always looking for my next win. And when it came to the Olympics and training for the Olympics, I gave everything that I had. I sacrificed everything. I competed all over the planet, and I also won all over the planet. I was sure that in 2012, I'd make my first Olympic team. I fell short just by two inches, two inches. You know, but that's, a, that's just how track and field is. And that's how life is as well. We, me we measure our progress on our path, on our path in inches. A mother who loves you and believes in you, you can move forward a few inches. A godmother who teaches you how to trust, you can move forward a few more inches. A difficult home, a death in your family, a death of your father, fall back a few inches. A caring teacher and a coach who will not let you give up under any circumstance, inch forward, just a few more steps. A new job getting paid to do what you love to do, inch further down that pathway. More training, higher hopes, bigger dreams. The 2016 Olympic Games are just inches down my pathway. The product of my environment, I don't think so, not anymore. I like to look at myself as a product of my potential. Thank you guys for listening to me. And I know you've heard all about my story. There are hundreds of children right now at Child Haven whose lives have already set them back a few inches. Children who've experienced further or worse than I ever had. Neglect that would actually break your heart. Abuse that we couldn't tolerate. But thanks to children, or thanks to Child Haven and people like you, they will not become a product of their environment. They will not be harmed with the negative experiences that their lives has marked them out to be at this moment. The children at Child Haven today, thanks to generous people like you guys, have unlimited potential to rise above their experiences and environments and to reach for the stars. I did, and I know that they can too. They just need you to help them inch down that pathway. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being here for the children of Child Haven. Thank you, Norris, for your story, for your unflinching honesty, your passion. It's fantastic. Uh, I, know, I know there's greatness ahead, and I think we all know there's greatness ahead for Norris as a coach, as an athlete, as a human being. Fantastic life ahead of you. I also want to thank Lori Henry, Maria Chavez Wilcox, uh, Boric Peshtar and our sponsors uh, for today's luncheon and also our, our very generous match donors. And on behalf of Child Haven, especially want to thank you for being here today, for choosing to make an impact in the lives of children and families. For thanks to you, they'll all have much brighter futures, futures ahead of them. And thanks to your support. Have a great rest of your day.